Hey, good morning. I'm so glad that you've joined us today. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. We're going to begin reading at verse 42. Acts 2, 42. This is one of my favorite scriptures regarding the church. This magnificent moment, the first day of the church when the Holy Spirit came in and swept upon the people that were meeting uh, together. Let's read beginning with verse 42. <clears throat> All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Father, as we begin our time here today, I pray for another great awakening to happen in our own lives, an awakening and, an, and a desire to see you do what only you can do. Father, I don't want to see what we can do. I want to be part of a church, part of a people that desire to see what you can do, the impossible. I love this story of this first day of the church, Pentecost Sunday, and what happened in the days and weeks following. If it's possible, Father, make that happen among us today, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. How do you define greatness? What is it that makes something or someone great? Friends, for example, what makes a friend of yours great? Is it the length of the friendship, how they make you feel, the special things they do for you, the fact that they've walked with you through difficult times? Right now, you're probably thinking about someone that does these things and even more. The truth is, it's not any one thing that makes them great, but a combination of many things. What makes a day great? For most of us, it includes at least one other person. You are sharing this day with someone else. Probably includes a favorite activity in one of your favorite places. One of our own Brad just came back from two weeks in South Africa. Just ask him about his trip. It's not just one thing that made the trip great, but a combination of things. What makes a sports team great? What's the difference between a winning season and a great season? You see, you can win most of your games, break all kinds of team records, but not have a great season if you don't win the last game. In the storied history of Major League Baseball, only three teams had more wins in the regular season than the Los Angeles Dodgers this year, only three. They won 111 games, which is incredible, yet they lost to the San Diego Padres in the playoffs. My point? Greatness isn't just one thing, but the combination of many things. So how was greatness defined in our faith? What is the difference between an average, run-of-the-mill Christian and one of the greats of our faith? Just as with a great friend, a great day, a great team in sports, what's true in marriage or a great employee and a great life lived is that it's not just one thing, but the combination of things. You see, I believe, and this is an important phrase, I believe with all my heart that a great commitment to the great commandment and the great commission will grow a great Christian. 
Let's look at these two passages of Scripture. They are known as the Great Commandment and the Great Commission. Notice that these are not suggestions. They aren't only good ideas. God has also made it clear that they are not an option for us to consider. They are the foundation, a summary of God's expectations for you and I. And you can find all five purposes for which we have been created in these two passages of Scripture. Let's look at them both and keep in mind Jesus is speaking here. And when he speaks, we really should pay attention. First, the great commandment found in Matthew 22, verses 37 through 39. You know these verses. It says, Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Love God. And the second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The great commandment. Now, the great commission. We find this in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. Jesus says this to his disciples. It's the last recorded words he spoke to his disciples in the book of Matthew. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching these new disciples to dis to obey all the commands I have given you. Welcome to our series in the last week, our last and final week of Purpose Driven Life. Over the last six weeks, we've said that God have had five reasons for making you. We learned that the Bible says we're made in the image of God. You're not an accident, that you were in God's mind long before you took your first breath. And he wanted you alive because he made you for a purpose. You're going to spend more time on the other side of death than on this side. This side of death is preparation for eternity. God wants you to practice here on earth what you're going to do forever in heaven. God made you for five reasons. Let's pay attention to these. Number one, you were planned for God's pleasure. You were planned for what? God's pleasure. That means God made you to love you. You don't have to be doing anything amazing or spectacular for God to love you. He just loves you. He made you to love you. He made you to enjoy you. Just like parents enjoy their kids, you were planned for God's pleasure. In the great commandment, we are instructed to love God with all that we are. It's the first and greatest commandment, Jesus said. It's number one, the most important, because God is meant to be the first in your life. I don't want you to miss this. He cannot be second. God cannot be second. It's seen in the first of the Ten Commandments. The first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. God is jealous and he desires more than anything to be first in our lives. That's what it means to worship and please God. You do that by making him your first. In church, he is your before anyone else. God is. Repeat this phrase right where you're at. God loves me. Two, you were formed for God's family. You were formed for what? God's family. That means God made you because he wanted a family. He created the human race and he knew that certain people would choose to become a part of his family. Everybody is created by God, but not everybody is in the family of God. You have to choose to be in the family of God by saying, I want to love you and trust you and follow your purposes for my life. In the Great Commission, Jesus instructs us to be baptized. Baptism is a sign. It's an indication of belonging to someone. Just as my wedding ring shows that I have a wife and I'm married and I belong to her, baptism is God's way of saying, you now belong to me. When, you're tell when you get baptized, you're telling the world you belong to Jesus and desire to be part of his family on earth. And that family is the church. You cannot do life alone. You cannot be a Christian 
without being attached to the body of Christ. I worship Christ when I'm outdoors. I get it. I speak with Jesus while I'm riding my motorcycle alone. But listen, church, you and I have been created to be in relationship with others. You and I have been created to be in relationship with others. And that happens in the context of a local church. God was the one who said, it is not good for man to be alone. And he created another. You and I have been created for each other. Repeat this phrase, I need others. That's right, I need others. Number three, you were created to become like Christ. God wants you to grow up spiritually. He wants you to develop spiritual muscles. He doesn't want you going around being a baby the rest of your life, living in spiritual diapers. He wants, he says, I want you to grow up to, to maturity. And the picture of maturity is Jesus Christ, God's son. Jesus in the Great Commission instructs us to obey all the commandments he gave us. And you cannot obey what you don't know. Therefore, we must be students of God's word. You have to read the Bible. You have to know it to meditate upon the words. You have to allow those words to shape your thoughts. Then you must put them into practice. Jesus defined foolishness as one who knows what the Bible says, but doesn't listen or obey. Church, don't be a fool. And don't fool yourself. If you call yourself a Christian but have no understanding of the scriptures, you are ignoring the one who gave his life for you. Repeat this phrase. Jesus is my example. That's right. Jesus is my example. The fourth reason God made you. The Bible says that God made you, that he actually shaped you for his purposes. God shaped you for his purposes. To serve him. He shaped you to serve him. You cannot serve God here on earth directly because you can't even see God on earth. The only way you can serve God on earth is by serving other people. God has uniquely shaped you with spiritual gifts and a heart and an ability and a personality and experiences. He made you and you, and he doesn't want you to be anyone else but you. He shaped you to serve him. We will spend the next couple of weeks looking at this purpose. It comes from the great commandment where Jesus told us that we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. That's right. You cannot love someone without serving them. Please hear me again. You cannot say you love someone without serving them. I'll say it another way. You are most like Jesus when you are serving another, when you do an act of kindness without expecting anything in return. You have unique spiritual abilities created by the hands of God himself. Everything about you can and should be used to serve others and bring God glory. Everything. So we preach this phrase, I have something to give. I have something to give. It's absolutely true. Finally, God has made you for a mission. You have a life mission and a life message that God wants to share through you in this world. Pastor Scott talked about that last week. In the Great Commission, Jesus makes it very clear that we are to be in the business of making disciples. You are here in this room because someone loved you enough to tell you about the good news of Jesus Christ. What a gift that person gave you. When was the last time you told them thank you? Thank you for caring enough. But the next question is very important. Who is going to heaven because you told them the good news? Who gets to spend eternity with Jesus because of you and your story? How many can you name? Last week I asked you to write down the name of one person. Keep praying for that one person and ask God to use you to be a witness 
to share your story of what Jesus has done for you. God loves people and he will answer that prayer. Repeat this phrase, God use me. That's a great prayer. God use me. Now let's talk about what it takes to be a great Christian. Remember from earlier where we looked at how it takes more than one thing to be a great friend or to have a great day or to be a great sports team? Well, what is true for them is also true for us as Christians. We looked at how we are created to be part of the body of Christ. But if that's all you do, if that's the only purpose that you focus on and you do it well, I mean, you never miss a Sunday. You love the church and you love connecting with others here on Sunday. But if you do that well and you neglect the other four, you are a consumer. You come and take, but you haven't learned yet the blessing of serving. You haven't discovered the power of God's word and what it means to grow up, to become mature in your faith. Or maybe for you, it's, it's uh, the, the purpose of becoming like Christ. And so you study the Bible like no other. You know it well, but that's only one of the five that you take seriously. It takes more than being a biblical scholar to be great in the kingdom of heaven. It's not simply believing in Jesus and then sitting on your spiritual bottom the rest of your life. That's not what it means to be a follower of Jesus. That's where it starts, by believing. But obeying requires intention. He requires more than a few minutes of your day. Jesus wants to walk with you throughout the day, influencing you, showing you opportunities to be like him. Ignoring that means that you have a hobby, not a relationship. You know the difference between a hobby and a passion. One you pursue with everything you have. The other gets your attention when you've done everything else. Church, can I remind you, Jesus is before anyone and anything else in your life. Church, I hope you see the importance of applying all five of the purposes of God for your life. God has identified each one of them multiple times in Scripture, clearly showing us what it means to truly be a follower of Jesus Christ. So a couple questions as we wrap up this week. Which one of the five comes easiest to you? Each of us are naturally passionate about one, maybe two, for me, it's the maturity purpose, to become like Christ. I get fired up about reading the Bible. I love discovering something new that I've not seen before. I love it when God's Spirit reveals a deeper truth and it takes me to a new place of understanding. Serving, that purpose is my weak spot. Going out of my way to show love without expecting anything in return, requires intentionality on my part. I don't do as well as I need to, so I follow others who naturally excel at this. This is my wife's sweet spot. Stina loves people by serving them better than anyone I've ever met. So identify the one purpose you do well, and then the one that you're weakest. And let me encourage you to share these two with those in your life group when you meet later this week. And, and please hear me when I say this. There's no shame in this. I did this publicly with, with all of you today. You should be able to trust those in your group this week with this information. But then share one thing you can do to make the weak one better. For example, if maturity Becoming like Jesus is your weak spot. Maybe you decide to increase your Bible reading by one day. I will read the Bible one more day this week 
than I make a practice of doing regularly in my life. Maybe you read again the seven days of that purpose from Purpose Driven Life and, and, <clears throat> and you allow God to show you your next step. He will show you if you give him time and space and listen. Here's the thing, church. We are not in a sprint. The Christian life is a marathon. We are to think long-term, not short-term. We're to think long-term. And so the question is, what's a simple step that you can commit to begin that will begin growth in your life? That's how you become great in the kingdom of God. Focus, obedience, saying yes to the one who said yes to you. Daily making choices that bring glory to God. Remember, church, a great commitment to the great commandment and the great commission will grow a great Christian. And what's true for Christians is also true for the church. Because a great commitment to the great commandment and the great commission will grow a great church as well. These past 40 days, they've been a great journey. It's been a great journey for me, and I truly hope and trust the same has been true for you. If you're a part of a life group this week, share some things about your experience over the last 40 days that have been very meaningful to you some insights that maybe you learned, some things that maybe you rediscovered, something you maybe knew but had forgotten about. And those have been an encouragement to you and they're helping you grow in your relationship with the Lord. And then share the five purposes, the one that is your strength and the one that is your weakness and what you're planning to do to make that even stronger. Let me pray for us today. Father, one of the things that I believe with all my heart is that if it matters to you, it must matter to me. If it's something that you value, then it must be something I value as well. It is obvious in Scripture that the five purposes that we have been looking at and have been walking through as a church We've been talking about them in our life groups. We've been looking at them on the weekend. They are so very important to you. They've made it in scripture many times, each one of them. And so, Father, I pray that you would help each one of us in our commitment, that we would have a great commitment to the great commandment, to love God and to love others, that we would have a great commitment to the great commission, that we would be about baptizing people, that we would be about, about uh, teaching others to follow you, and that we would go not only here in Missoula and the surrounding areas, but even to the utmost parts of the world to teach others and to show others the good news of Jesus Christ. Five things, very important. And when we focus and when we do these with all of our heart, We're becoming great in the kingdom of God. And I can think of no better thing to excel at, to be great at. Thank you for loving us the way that you do. You are such an amazing God. We humbly pray these things in the mighty and powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to thank you for joining us today. And I want to encourage you once again that if you haven't yet joined a church, we would love, we would be honored if you would join us here on location, Sunday mornings, 11 o'clock, 1525 South Avenue West in Missoula. We're right near the mall. Have a great day.